Hi, Christina here, founder of Liberate. I wanted to let you know that all of our amazing practitioners, healers, and intuitives are available for remote sessions. And we are continuously adding new classes, workshops, and meditations to serve you every week. Thank you for joining us, and I hope that we can help you liberate yourself. Hi, this is Christina Dam, and this is Liberate the Podcast, where we educate, motivate, inspire, and liberate your consciousness. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Liberate the Podcast. Today, we have David Scharf with us. He is one of our meditation instructors that teaches meditation every, um, I think it's first Wednesday of the month, and we sometimes change the schedule up a little bit, but he's been practicing meditation for over 40 years. He has a lot of divine knowledge and wisdom that he can share with everybody, um, and You know, today the topic and the focus is going to be about the uh, teacher-student relationship. Um, And I think that this is the perfect time in like our time period right now because there is a lot of people that claim to be teachers that maybe aren't teachers and then people that are are really teachers that are are so humble that they don't even say it. So um, I want to have a great discussion and so we welcome David. David, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So the topic of spiritual, uh, our spiritual kind of teacher-student relationship, you know, what made you think about that being a great subject for today's podcast? And then, okay, well, you know, it is one of the most defining things about uh, spiritual path, and it doesn't matter. You know, I'm a Buddhist. Doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist, you're a Shaivite, Native American shaman tradition, doesn't matter what tradition you're in. I mean, it's true of Kabbalah, it's true of Christian mysticism. The transmission of knowledge and wisdom from a teacher to a student is the primary and central path feature. So all of the types of practices that you do, those are really important. That's, you know, the methods are really important. But without that teacher-student relationship, being both genuine uh, and also sincere, then there isn't this opportunity for a a transmission to happen. There isn't the opportunity for a more profound transformation to happen for the student. You know, if we're just who we are and we're set and we don't think we can grow, then that's a relationship that we've established with the teacher that doesn't allow their blessings to flow to us. Absolutely. And I want to I want to backtrack a little bit because I know what you mean by using the word transmission, but a lot of people that are tapping in um, and tuning in might not know what that is. And so do you want to elaborate a little bit more on the the terminology of a transmission? Yes. So, you know, it's actually a really broad term because you can get a transmission from somebody on how to cook a meal. They can just like walk you through it. They show you like, start with this, cook that first, then add this. And that's a type of transmission. It's information, Mm -hmm. data, you know. And then there's a transmission where um, it's a little more uh, uh, esoteric. There's Mm -hmm. a transmission where it's about knowledge, not just information, but it's about knowledge. And so somebody who's holding a lot of knowledge or spiritual experience, they're able to uh, clarify things to you. You know, it's... um, Kind of like if you want to be a really good tennis player or violinist, you might be one of those people that's a prodigy and you can pick up the instrument and wow, you just knock everybody's socks off. Yeah. But everyone else needs to go to a pro, a teacher, needs somebody who can start you and guide you through the steps. Like first you need to learn your scales, then you need to learn proper fingering. They need to give you one step at a time the information, the skills, but then also teach you about the performance, which is a more subtle and not palpable thing. It's something that that you do with all the information that you have. They impart that as well, you know, and they have gotten that from their years of experience. It's not just, you know, doing the scales. It's not just playing a piece of music. Mm -hmm. They have learned how to put their self-expression into it. They've learned how to deal with their energy in it. And so a teacher uh, who teaches spiritual practice, they give you certain things that you do, certain exercises to do, certain practices, ways of doing meditation. They give you those as a process, which is kind of like learning how to do push-ups. Then how do you use your body strength? Then they teach you that, which is this kind of oral teaching. 
back and forth of being able to let you know about the details. And then there's one other kind of transmission. Well, there are many, but there's one other really key kind of transmission, okay. which is when you're sitting in the presence of a great teacher, a teacher who has accomplishment, a teacher who has practiced enough so that their mind has been transformed, so that they're kind of they're operating in a different mind space than most people. When you're sitting with a teacher like that, it's almost like a tuning fork. You know, the okay. smaller tuning fork tunes into and synchronizes with the larger tuning fork. So just sitting with a teacher like this without them saying anything or doing anything or telling you anything about what to practice, being in their presence, there's another kind of transmission that happens. And it is a nonverbal transmission. It can be symbolic. Like they might raise their hand or they might turn their head a certain way. And all of a sudden there's some experience that you have where, you know, you recognize something in yourself that connects to the teacher uh, in Tibetan tradition. Sometimes they talk about mind to mind transmission and it's very, you have to be careful because we don't want to imagine it if it isn't happening. But if you're sitting with a great teacher, you can have a transformative experience without there being any teaching, so to speak, being given. Yeah, and that was what I was, I was looking at as far as the special form of transmission that is that nonverbal or that other information that is descended down upon the disciple or, you know, given it's, it's information, it's vibration, it's divine wisdom that's unteachable, right? Mm -hmm. You know, as far as in the contextual uh, way of, okay, we can read this textbook, we can do this different information, but you're going to absorb something in a different way that's almost in this magical aspect. And science is finally coming in and having that awareness of some of those other aspects. And I like the way that you gave the tuning fork because I think most of the people that are tapping in and listening to our podcast would have some kind of a sense of agreement that we're energy beings and mm -hmm. that at different times, even within your life or your day to day, even in your a single day, you might have a different levels of energy vibration within yourself. And there's certain people that just being in their presence can have a very negative effect. And also there's certain people that can have a very profound positive effect and they have this, the pull and that pull you know, it, it pulls your energetic vibration to that. And so, you know, there's a lot to be said about these amazing teachers that they spend, you know, lifetimes upon lifetimes uh, really tapping in to the power of connection to a higher voltage, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they can just give that to people when they're in their presence and you, you know, some people can feel it. I mean, that makes me think about one time I was at um, our Ahadic yoga retreat and one of there's, there's five, five masters in the pranic healing discipline. And one of them went and sat next to me during, um, during uh, it was either lunch or dinner. And I just started spinning. <laughs> I was like, woo! And it was just, there was so much energy, you know, that I, I was like, my body was so overwhelmed in a good way, but my, whatever was going on in my system, my, my, my body, just like that tuning fork went and gravitated right towards that vibration. And I became a different energy. And there's, there's something to be said. And then the wisdom, right? I think about like the classic karate kid of wax on, wax off and the subtleties yes. of the wisdom. See, that's you know? the method. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, what you brought up is a really important point because sometimes we don't know what's happening when there's transmission. Like there's the example where, oh, I'm sitting and there's a teacher in front of me and there's this awesome experience that happens because I tune into the teacher. That's all very intentional. Sometimes it doesn't happen quite like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I've had uh, a friend of mine told me a story of he didn't know that he had just met his teacher in this lifetime, but he was sitting a few people down from him on a pew in a, in a temple. And he's like, he felt started to feel uneasy. Like he felt a little queasy in his stomach, you know, and he, he was like, am I sick? What's going on? And he said he started to feel like there was this energy coming from over there. Mm -hmm. And he didn't know what it was. And he kind of kept looking over like, there's this little guy not dressed up in robes or anything like that. Just this guy sitting there on the seat. 
And afterwards, he found out that he was this Tibetan Lama, and he ended up taking him as his teacher. Um, but he, he said, there was this guy whose energy I couldn't get beyond. Like, once I met him, that was everything. I didn't know who it was at first. I just was feeling it. And, you know, there's the other thing, which is sometimes people tune into it, and they keep it small. Like, they don't know that they've tapped into something big, but they keep it small in their mind. A friend of mine met my Tibetan teacher, and she was like, oh, he's so cute. He's so cute. And in her mind, that was it. He's so cute. That was a point of transmission. She was getting yeah. something from when she scrunched up and said, he's so cute. You know, yeah. she was getting something and connecting to it. She didn't know exactly what it was, but whenever she thought of him, and I just know this from how it works, you know, whenever she thought of him, there was something that was flowing. Um, and so that's, there's a level of transmission where you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily know what's going on. There was one other one that I love where um, there was a, a fellow that I brought to the Dharma and he kept hearing my stories about my teachers. And he was like, I really want to have this thing happen. We're like, wow, you know. And uh, he went to see one of these great teachers who barely ever teaches publicly. But he found a way to get into this class with this teacher. And he said he was driving home. And he started thinking like, oh, what am I doing with my life, you know? Like, I don't know if what I'm doing really matters. I, I don't know what's going on with myself. And he said he pulled over to the side of the road. And he started to cry. And he was like, when he was telling me the story, he was like, oh, nothing happened. And I said, you just told me you pulled over the road and started to cry and question your life. You think that's nothing happening? That's a big deal. <laughs> well, it's so interesting how our, our minds rationalize and justify, you know? And so like whether it's one friend thinking, oh, he's just so cute or like, oh, nothing happened because... Uh, the displacement of connection or correlation. Sometimes people don't, you know, put together that mm -hmm. everything is interconnected in such a profound way that there is a reason that this happens after this. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we kind of back check a little bit, I would love to hear your story of when you uh, discovered your first uh, spiritual teacher and how did you know that it was a teach it was one of your teachers because I think that's a lot of what people question and and they don't know like how do I identify you know some people are searching and saying I want a spiritual teacher I want you know uh, to be a disciple I want to learn I want to have these profound transmissions but they they don't even know how to identify if somebody shows up so right. I would love to backtrack in your life and hear about your first and also maybe telling people, can people have more than one teacher? Cause I'm, you know, like I think a lot of people have multiple, you know, and maybe yeah. you don't, maybe you think there's just one major teacher in your life. Well, I think both of those are true. You can have multiple teachers, but usually there is one major teacher that kind of weeds out as like, this is the real source of my growth. This is the real this is the guide that I need to follow for the rest of my life. The, like my uh, friend said, the teacher I couldn't get around. Meaning like uh -huh. once you meet that one, you've, you don't need to meet others. You've found the main one. You might still meet other teachers, but like that teacher is the main teacher in your life. So that, uh, it always kind of sorts out that way. And it's funny, you know, for my path, uh, I've had the, the good fortune to meet teachers in different traditions. Uh, mm -hmm. My first spiritual teacher was actually a Native American woman. And, um, and the story is, a, it's something where you can't doubt that you've met someone when all sorts of coincidences fire off, you know, um, meeting my root teacher later on, who became my soul teacher was much more subtle, but I'll, I'll kind of give the short version of each one. All right. The, yeah. Meeting my first teacher. Um, I was into crystals. This is in the eighties. I was into crystals and I was just learning about them. And uh, I had a friend who was kind of guiding me through it. And I started collecting them and she was telling me about programming crystals. I had no idea what she was talking about. I was thinking about computers, you know, and she was talking about programming crystals. And then a friend of mine, I had gotten a really beautiful, incredibly beautiful black tourmaline wand. And I just knew uh -huh. there was something really special about it. You know, it was terminated on both sides. It really felt like a magical piece so a friend of mine gave me an article about this, about black tourmaline. And I read it and it talked about how it, uh, it creates a positive energy. It repels negative energy is what the uh, article yeah. said. Um, but uh, 
I gathered all my crystals together because I heard that there was, it was the first full moon of the astrological new year. And somebody had told me, this is the best time to program your crystals because it'll last the whole year. It's kind of like sets the intention for the whole year. So I was like, great. I took all of these crystals out to the suburbs where my parents lived and I lined them up from like the darkest crystal to the brightest crystal. And I was near a body of water and I could see the reflection of the moon. And I just was like breathing this intention in like, please unite and bring me to a teacher, connect me with a teacher. Um, and the next morning I woke up, I was gonna go back into the city and I had an incredible toothache, like agony. And I ended up needing to get root canal, emergency oh. root canal. And, and you didn't have I any mean, pain the night before? Nothing, nothing. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and, and I was planning on going back into the city, you know, 10 in the morning, 11 in the morning, so I could get brunch with friends. And uh, I had to go, find a surgeon, you know, to get root canal. And I was in agony. So I ended up getting on a train at like four in the afternoon and I'm waiting for the painkillers to kind of kick in. And I'm worried because it's hurting already. And I think, all right, I'm going to go sit in one of these seats that has like a wall behind it. So I can kind of section myself off and look out the window and just meditate. So I don't get in a lot of pain. So I'm heading for this seat and there's some woman sitting in that seat and she's wearing some crystals. And I'm like, oh God, what's going on here? Is this someone I'm supposed to meet or is this just some old hippie lady who's sitting in a seat? Like what's happening? So yeah. I decided to sit across from her on the other side and spy on her a little bit to see what's going on. And she was reading this magazine that I really loved at the time. And I did one of these test the universe things. I was like, okay, if she likes this magazine, then I'm gonna talk to her. And I watched sidelong spying on her. I watched as she just like clucked her tongue at every page like, oh, oh. Ugh. And I was like, hmm, I guess it's not something, you know. And she gets towards the end, and all of a sudden, she, like, opens up, and she's like, oh, wow. And I was like, okay, my signal. And I kind of lean over, and I was like, it's beautiful, isn't it? She goes, yeah, it is. I said, those are some nice crystals you're wearing. And she noticed the crystal I was wearing. She goes, you're wearing a pretty cool crystal, too. And I just sort of opened it up, and she said, what do you know about crystals? And I said, you know, I've been playing with them. I don't really know too much. And um, I said, but I, I just found out about this incredible, you know, black tourmaline. And I realized that a lot of people say it repels negative energy. It feels to me like it creates more of a harmonic field that keeps disharmony at bay. Uh -huh. and she said, who taught you that? I said, I just got it, you know. And she leaned over to me and she said, it takes the eagle two wings to fly. One is positive. One is negative. When we use the word negative to mean bad, we're dishonoring the feminine energy. And I was like, wow, okay. And then <laughs> she said, um, what's your name? I said, David. I said, what's your name? She said, Oshana. And I, I said, wait, Oshana. That rings a bell. Oh, there you oh, go. Yep, hold on, I'm back. So, okay. so I said, Oshana, that rings a bell and I reached into the bag that had all these crystals and I pulled out this article about how to program your crystals that my friend had given me and it had an article attached to it that it, it had a piece about black tourmaline and then attached to it was an interview with someone about how to program crystals and it was an interview with her. Wow. So I just was like, okay, uh, wow, look at this. And she goes, yeah, it works. You should come to one of my classes. And for the next few years, she was my teacher and I studied her tradition. And it was, it was only after a while I realized that like, I was not going to be offering tobacco and cornmeal every day of, our, of my life. So uh, I ended up gravitating towards other teachers in different traditions. So if you, if you want, then I'll tell you the Buddhist version when I met my yeah. Buddhist teacher. Okay. Um, I found but I wanna, that there was, wait, I want to yeah. stop though. I want to like yeah. have people highlight um, the, the fact that you listen to your intuition, uh -huh. you know, like you ask for something. It's really important <laughs> for people to know, like you were very clear. You did a ritual, whether it was the crystals in that night or whether it was just how solid and firm your deafness was in you mm -hmm. that it's mm -hmm. time I want a teacher the very next day you're brought but you pay attention to the synchronicities and you allow for that to unfold
but you also gave it up and said, if this is, the sign is going to happen. And if it's not, then, you know, I'm just reading into this, right? And you had the synchronicity show and you had the sign be validated. And so it's a nice thing, you know, for people to try on. It doesn't mean that everybody is going to work in the same way. But I think that there's something to be said about being clear and communicating your readiness and being open to see what interesting things transform and how it could happen in the most unlikely event that you might think of, you know, like you're going to get a root yeah. canal. You're not thinking you're meeting your teacher, you know? Right. Right. I mean, I was thinking this is the worst. I didn't yeah. realize it was going to turn into this is the best and that uh, that's also something that is hard to recognize, but often important to recognize is sometimes the thing that we don't want leads us to what is important. Um, so I think even that's directly. most of the time, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, like yeah. I, I, I hardly know somebody that genuinely um, can look at and evaluate once some time and emotional like processing has happened that some of the worst experiences in their life that they can't see how it steered or how I had them pivot to some of the best experiences in their life. I, yeah. I don't think that those things don't it's, exist together it's, you know it's, it's not an accident <laughs> there's no such thing as an accident in the world of spiritual pursuit um so yeah and it is really you know um listening uh i think that's really the the best kind of way of describing it is as you're going along always be listening so to speak to what's happening so not just physically listening to sound but being receptive to the environment noticing um paying attention and being open, as you said, like, what could this mean? What might yeah. this mean? You know, and, and some people are over, you know, they go overboard. It's like everything is an omen. Oh, the uh -huh. wind blew to the left. What does that mean? Sometimes the oh, wind yeah. is blowing, you know, and it's not, it's not and significant. Some things just are what they are. So, you know, right. like, and, lime and, just fell from is, the tree. It doesn't mean that just because it rolled to the right, that that means that you need to suddenly take the right, you know, but. Um, it, it can which be can dangerous. <laughs> Yeah, which can be paralyzing for people because then they they don't take ownership of their own. It's almost like their free will has been given away to so much in everything else instead of like, right. okay, I can make decisions and choices too. That's a really good thing that you brought that up. Yeah, and people, you know, it's where it's the dangerous road when you start thinking that everything is a communication you know, from something higher. Cause then like, it's like you said, you give up your free will and you're following this fantasy of like, Oh, there are beings talking to me that are telling me what to do. They're telling me to turn left because there's a breeze, you know, they're telling me to get in this car because light shone on it in a weird way. Like it's one thing to be receptive to the possibility, but it's another thing to be, to have a faculty of reasoning to recognize yeah. that not everything that happens. In fact, most things that happen are not signs from the universe. Yeah. Um, if you ask for signs, they might happen. Sometimes they don't. Even if you ask really intensely, you just got to wait. You got to wait and watch and be receptive and see what happens. Uh, so that's yeah, because it, it is really important. Because sometimes when you really want a sign, if you're not ready, you know, it's. I could have walked right by her and yeah. sat down in a different seat and been like, whatever. You know, yeah. she was sitting in the seat I wanted onto the next. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, do you want to hear the Buddhist one now? Yes. Okay, I'll just, again, I, I, these stories, I could just go on and on and on because I've met a lot of different teachers and always that experience of encountering a genuine teacher, there's something that we can point to that's profound. Even if it seems simple, that's the case when there really is a lot of profundity in the simple. So um, I used to work at a spiritual bookstore in New York and mm -hmm. I was the manager. And so every day I would open up and close up, you know, cash register, do everything. And back in those days, a bulletin board was actually a cork board and people stuck flyers up on it. And uh, so there was a flyer that somebody had put up. And every day as I was closing up, I'd look up and there's this guy like smiling, this big smile. And he's got like the, he's got a little top knot and he's wearing like the Tibetan robes, you know, so he looks really, um, he looks really like authentic. Yeah, he's smiling this ear to ear smile and is so squinty and smiling. I'm like, what is this guy so happy about? You know, I'm like typical New Yorker. I've already met spiritual teachers, but I'm kind of a typical New Yorker. I'm like, what? What are you so happy about? Like, what? 
you know. So after a few days of this, I, I go up and I look at the flyer. And it's this teacher, Tibetan teacher named Chagdun Tulku Rinpoche. Okay. And he's teaching in New York. And I'd already missed two days out of the four or five days that he was teaching. But I, I was like, okay, I got to get there before I miss the rest of it. So the next day I went down and he was teaching in this loft downtown on the Bowery in the most unlikely location. And I went into this place and inside on the second floor is a beautiful Tibetan shrine and everybody is sitting on the floor on cushions. And there's this guy up on this brocade covered like throne and he's got a translator next to him. And there's this whole kind of drama and, and presence happening. And uh, I watch him and he's, He's teaching, at first I didn't realize he's teaching in English, but it's all very heavy accent and with the, uh -huh. the verb at the end, like Yoda, you know, I to the store going, you know, like this whole thing. And he's got this translator who's a Western woman, translating his English to English that everybody else can understand. And they kind of have a little bit of a shtick going on where like he'll say something and she'll ask a question. He'll kind of like tease her. And, you know, at one point he talks for a really long time and she's like, Rinpoche, Rinpoche, I have to translate. And he goes, why? I English speaks and they English speaks and why translates a need? So he's funny and she's doing this bit with him. And, I'm, and then also when she's translating, then he sits back and he kind of goes into this meditative state. So it's this back and forth, back and forth. And I'm like, this is something going on here, right? You know, yeah. um, maybe, I have, maybe I'm connecting with something here. This feels really intense and genuine. And I've never seen anybody like this guy. So we're breaking for lunch. And he says, um, uh, during the lunch break, I'm going to give a, an empowerment, a transmission into this practice of, of Tara, the, the Buddha of compassion, the female Buddha of compassion. He goes, mm -hmm. this form of Tara is something that all my students do wherever my centers are around the world. They all do this practice. So if anybody is here who's part of my, my group or wants to be part of the group, you should get this empowerment if you haven't gotten it before, this transmission. And so I was like, okay, I, lunch can wait, you know? Um, yeah. So I sit there and people are just kind of like milling around and starting to get out. And in this tradition, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, the teacher has to do a little bit of preparation before they give this transmission, right? And yeah. so they do the preparation. They visualize certain things and they do certain mantra and they get themselves ready to be able to give these blessings over to the students. Well, he takes off his prayer beads, his mala, and he starts doing his mantra. And it was just like, he didn't like chant it out loud. It was really like he almost muttered it. He was like, like a, like a mumbo, right? Yeah. But then I felt something. There was like my hair kind of stood on end and my heart started to beat. It was like I got hit by a wave of something. And it was palpable to me. And it was powerful. And really, I mean, to be honest, like it's happening right now. I started to tear up. I was like, ah, I don't know what this is, but this is it. This is really it. This is the real deal. And I became his student. I ended up running his center in New York. And I ended up wow. moving to his center in Northern California, a New Yorker living in Northern California at some retreat center where there are 30 people. Never thought that would happen. I lived there for two years and did all sorts of work in retreat and, and other practices and study. And it was really, that was it. Meeting him, I couldn't get past him. My life turned like a hinge from one direction into another. And everything since that day has been different. Wow. And so you, you so, I mean, and he, he's still your teacher today? Well, he's not in the body I met. Okay. Um, he left his body in 2002. I still feel a very strong connection with him. Uh, he's been found. His reincarnation is 15. Uh, he's in Tibet. I can't wait to meet him. Um, some of the students that are friends of mine uh, and were students of his previous incarnation with me, they've already gone to Tibet and been able to meet him when there was a brief period where the borders were open. Okay. And I've seen pictures of him. And he's, you know, I don't know. Everybody says it's him, and I guess when I meet him one day, I'll know. From the pictures, he looks pretty cool. You know, he's got, a, got that swag that Chagda Grimpache had, that intensity. That's amazing. And so, yeah. you know, I want to talk also about something that you were really called to dive in to your spiritual teaching, 
to the point where you gave up a lot of earthly sacrifices, right? You know, like moving, working for him, different things. Do you think that for people that are listening, is it always the case to really deep dive into the spiritual lessons or can can you maintain some of the n- normalcy of life and still, or does, do you have to dive in for a little bit? Well, it really depends on what you, what you want out of it or what you believe you can get out of it. And so yeah. uh, in my mind, if you want to kind of stay in the world, you should deep dive for a while to get, you know, to get uh, saturated I yeah. kind of think of it like school. You know, if you want to get a medical degree, you can't like keep your job in the city and just hang out and say, oh, I'm studying medicine and I'm going to be a doctor. That's a good um, example. <laughs> you got to go. You got to go to school to really learn it. You got to go to school. And then when you come out, you've not only learned it, but like you're board certified. Like you have been given the permission and you're legally allowed to operate yeah. as a doctor. So I, I do think there's a lot to be said for getting comfortable with it. So you might be like, I think I want to be a doctor. And then you go and you hang out with some doctors and you, you kind of like, maybe you watch some reality shows about some doctors and you kind of feel that attraction and that interest. And so you, you get yourself a little closer, a little closer. But if you, if you don't, go to school. If you don't kind of do the deep dive at some point, you won't come out the other side really equipped to live in the ordinary, the everyday world and balance that with a spiritual life. You won't really have the balance. Chagdur Drimpache used to say, say, if you have the ordinary world for 23 hours a day and you only meditate for one hour a day, if it's a tug of war, who's going to win? Yeah. You know? So, and even if you meditate two or three hours a day, like that's a lot. You have, to, you, you have to give it a try at some point. Give it a try. might not work for you, but give it a try where you go on a retreat and it's like a 10-day retreat or a, a month-long retreat under the guidance of a teacher. You know, some people do longer. I had friends who went into retreat when I did a six-week one and they didn't come out for a couple of years. Like, there's all degrees of immersion, but I think you got to go and start, start with a few days, <laughs> maybe do a month. Do something where you really get into it and you get out of everyday mind enough to see that there's something beyond that. Yeah, total immersion. And, and that leads to further transformation. I think that the example of medical school is a perfect example for people to cognitively get and understand that, you know, they're, they're spending, you know, eight hours a day this, eight hours a day in residency and, and then four hours studying and sleeping for four hours, you know, like, but that's what's needed for them to master the physiology of the human body, right? You know, to a certain extent. Um, now, what are some of the benefits that you think that people get from really, you know, I mean, I get that it, a lot of it is when people are drawn but what do you think some of the benefits for really diving in and growing your spiritual connection is? Well, um, you know, there's a lot of stories about people attaining degrees of realization and then they have these spiritual powers or they can like, you know, read minds or they can levitate or, you know, I mean, walk on water, like all, all the different stories of great beings who've attained some kind of power. Cities is the uh, Sanskrit word for it. They've attained these cities. And um, my teacher actually put it much more simply. He said, if your practice is working, if your practice is really good, then you find that over time, the poisons of the mind grow less powerful. So mm-hmm. your anger and your you know, jealousy and all of these things that really torture us that we can't seem to overcome. Over time, the more you practice, the less those poisons of the mind affect you, the more quickly you recover from them if you have a moment. He yeah. said, but really the sign of practice is that you become more compassionate to other beings, that your compassion grows, and that your devotion to teachers grows, that your devotion to the sources of practices and of blessings, your devotion to that grows, and your compassion. So your devotion and your compassion grow, and your mind grows more peaceful and calm. Those are really powerful benefits. You know, I mean, walk on water, sure, that's like 
a miracle. I get it. But if you as a person in the everyday world can be more compassionate, have more devotion to spiritual practice, and have less poisons of the mind manifesting in your everyday life, that's what spiritual practice really is supposed to get us to. Yeah, overall more peace. And I mean, even at, you know, touch on that again, walking on water is mm -hmm. great. And it's, uh, it would be a war reading people's minds or whatever people want to do, which is great for the nostalgic moment or two or the, that right. newness, like going on like a roller coaster ride. But if you keep on going on the same roller coaster, it doesn't, it doesn't have the same adrenaline. It doesn't have the same like feeling it kind of becomes boring because it's like, eh, been there, done that, you know? And you can, and, and you can get addicted to it. You yeah. Know? And but, addicted to the thrill. Yeah. But you know, or the thrill dissipates, right? So either right. you become addicted or it dissipates over a time. And then, but overall enjoyment and peace of mind. I mean, I think that, I mean, even in America, we have it on every, every bill, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People are looking <laughs> for that happiness. Well, what is happiness? Peace of mind, comfort, like good positive thoughts, not beating each other or beating themselves up, having peace, right? You know? Uh, so that sounds like something that I think everybody wants to sign up for. <laughs> yep. Everybody wants to be happy and everybody wants to have less suffering. And so if spiritual practice can make you feel happier and make you feel less pain and suffering, mental and emotional pain and suffering, that's it. Like that's the big goal. And, and, you know, we, we make up goals based on the rumors we hear about teachers and enlightenment and all of this stuff. It's like, oh, I want to be able to this. I want to be able to that. Actually, there's one really funny story where uh, one teacher did these question and answer satsangs. And, and uh, he was one of the first Tibetans to bring Tibetan Buddhism to the West. So this is in the 70s. And okay. he, there's, there are these people doing question and answer with him. And he's talking about how hope and fear are both mental traps. Mm -hmm. So like, if they're the same thing, but with different uh, sides of the experience, two sides of the same coin, right? Mm -hmm. And this woman got up and she was like, but Rinpoche, I really hope to be enlightened. And he was like, oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry. You know, because that really is an obstacle. Like if yeah. you're spending your time doing this to become something, then you're tied up in that dynamic and you're not yeah. going to be able to experience what actually is happening. Yeah, you're, you're attached to the future instead of being present. Key, very important point, yes. And, yeah, I, I, that's a really you know, great example because a lot of people think that it's better to be hopeful, you know, yeah. or there's, there's this level of, like, hope's good, fear's bad, this kind of duality type of uh, mindset, but really – wishful thinking and any things and putting yourself into a different mindset of having attachment is not good. <laughs> yeah. You want to have a positive mindset. It's good to be optimistic. Yeah. You know, it's good to have faith, but that doesn't mean that you have hope. Hope actually means that you don't think something is going to happen in a way. Yeah. You're not so you have to hope for it, you know, whereas having faith and, and, you know, faith is an overused word too, but like, Having faith to me means that you have trust that what you're going to go through, whether it's good or not, is going to be something that's important. And so it isn't like you, you know, let yourself fall into bad situations. But yeah. faith means that you have this optimism that yeah. what you go through will be important in this life, whatever it is. So it isn't, it isn't all good. You don't hope for something good. You don't fear something bad. That's how you create karma that you don't want to ripen back on you by trying to cling to happiness and trying to avoid suffering, you get in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you said it so perfectly. I, it, that the, the lack of faith and that people aren't trusting, right? Because it, when you know, you know, and you don't have to continue to hope and say, you know, let's, let's say like one that's like always gets people is either like finance or romance. And, oh, is he or she going to call or <laughs> he, she, she going to call? Is he, she going to, you're not trusting it, you know? And if anything, you're kind of pushing it further away because you're not feeling that it, it's already an aspect of your life. In a way, right? Right there. 
At least yeah, I mean, and, and that's, yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. I, I, I can hear, hear you. you. I lost you for a second. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it's really about um, expectation. And, yeah. and the idea that, oh, is she going to call? Is he going to call? Or when will that money come? And, you know, one day it'll happen. And all of this, like you said, part of it is you're living in the future rather than the present. And the other part is that you're, you're trying to manipulate in a way your yeah. experience. You're, you're really trying to create something specific rather than being attentive and listening or noticing what is happening. Um, I, you know, and this is, I keep saying, oh, one of my teachers said this, and one of my teachers said that. That's a key to the t- teacher-student relationship is that you notice that a lot of the things they say are not these uh, incredible, momentous teachings, but they, in a moment, they turn your mind. You know, they, they shift your way of thinking. So like my teacher saying, devotion and compassion are the true sign of practice. I was like, oh, of course. Well, that makes sense. That simplifies everything. Another one of my teachers said, um, everything always works out. It just doesn't always work out the way you want it to. Absolutely. So, you know, you have to trust that the way it works out is important for you. Mm-hmm. So, and, bring, uh, and that goes back to your two stories, you know, of the two of the teachers that showed up in your life. It might have been not how you saw, like, you know, you had to shift your um, moment or your plans. I mean, I don't think you were planning to go into the dentist's office to get like a root canal and you weren't, you know, planning that that night or the next day to go to where the flyer was, but you shifted and you rearranged to allow yourself to be where is needed. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah, and also deciding to to look at that flyer that was up on the cork board and say, what is going on here? Why is this guy smiling? Maybe I should go see him. You know, like I could have just kept opening and closing and be thinking, what's he so happy about? And never looked at it and never caught those teachings. I could have missed the missed the whole thing, you know, walked yeah. right by it. Or, or, or made a judgment in your mind and said, oh, I already missed two days. So, and next, right. you know, instead of being like, well, I'll go, you know? Yep. And then, and, let me in. and yeah. then listening to, to that wisdom of saying, well, I don't need to eat lunch right now. Let me have this experience, you know? So there was so many times that you resisted maybe the logical mind and went with your trust instead. Or the comfortable mind, you know? Yeah. <laughs> the logical comfortable mind yeah <laughs> yeah I think that the comfortable mind um uh, yeah and so and i don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about what uh true teacher or that kind of subject you mentioned like the different kinds of teacher or do you want do you yeah. have other questions sure let's go into that it's where you, that's where okay. you're you're being guided so i'd love that sure and you know it's it's kind of Uh, We talked about um, the fact that there are, you go to a pro to learn an art, you know, you go to somebody who knows it through their years of experience, a violinist to learn violin or a tennis pro to learn tennis, whatever it is. So there are people that get you there first. So people who are kind of like friend teachers, you know, spiritual friends that are kind of there with you, there for you. Or you meet them and they kind of tell you about someone that you should go see. And it's just one of those things where they're not a teacher themselves, but they're a spiritual friend and they help you get to a teacher. So, and they might be, they might kind of be a teacher for a while. You know, they might be the, the uh, teacher's assistant, you know, or the student teacher who kind of are like getting you ready to meet the teacher by giving you teachings and by, like I did with my other friend when I was telling him about meeting teachers and then he went and met the teacher and cried on the side of the road. I wasn't his teacher, but I told him a lot of stories and he liked my stories and he went to meet a teacher. So there's that kind of spiritual friend teacher. Um, Yeah, the, the gatekeeper opener. You know? Right, right. Someone who really walks you up to that gate and, and lets you see that there's something to walk through. Um, and maybe even confirms, hey, you just walked through something. You should take a look at that. You know, So there's that spiritual friend that can be a really important teacher, especially at the beginning of the path. Um, and then you meet a teacher that has the uh, capacity to give this kind of depth of teaching, a transmission, or if not really an esoteric transmission, at least some teaching that has been handed down 
from teacher to student, teacher to student, like that kind of a, a, that kind of a lesson, if not a transmission. And uh, and so pure lineage in that way is also really important. You know, you can have a beautiful Tiffany lamp, but if it isn't plugged into the wall, no light is going to come out of it. So like you can meet a teacher that like has all the trappings and looks amazing, might even have a huge organization, might even be famous, wrote a book, gets a lot of money to teach. But if they're not plugged into a lineage where the teacher that taught them that got those teachings from a teacher who taught them that going back stage after stage and each one of them attained some degree of wisdom through that practice. It's not like, Oh, you should have met my teacher's 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 teacher because he was really intense. Well, where's the connection to you? It's like telephone. You lost your signal loss. You know, yeah. what do you got? What teacher do you have that you learned from that was tapped into lineage? No signal loss. So mm -hmm. when you meet a teacher with lineage, that's a different kind of teacher. Um, and then when you meet a teacher that can give transmission, that's a higher level of teacher. And yeah. then there's really that highest level of teacher that I was talking about where you meet a teacher and you can't get past that teacher. Your life hinges around that moment. Everything changes. Even if you don't spend a lot of time around the teacher, you don't have to move to the teacher's center, you know, and live there for two years for there to be this powerful life-changing event. Um, yeah. You might just meet a teacher and spend very little time with them, but everything after that point changes. And so after I met Chagdeep Rinpoche, I've met hundreds of other lamas uh, some of them becoming hugely important in my life, some of them that I spent more time with than I spent with him. And I look at him, though, as he's the reason, because after him, if it weren't for him, I wouldn't have yeah. met them. So he was that turning point. So they call that a root lama in, in Tibetan Buddhism. That's your root lama. And all the other teachers you might have are like branches that come out from the root. I love that. And so different kinds of teachers, yeah. Many different types of teachers and distinguishing between them for, you know, for those that are listening for your own practices and development. But I like those distinctions. And we chatted just a minute right before we started about how these changing of times is actually allowing for more opportunity to spend with teachers and learnings and you know so do you want to share a little bit on that yeah you know um it's actually kind of it's a a part of the path that can be a little uh daunting is being able to find teachers you know and so um i had the good fortune of the fact that a lot of tibetans came through new york you know and and this native american teacher came through new york was on the commute with me you know so that's like really incredible good fortune. Um, and I'm grateful for it my whole life and every day. Uh, but sometimes people have to make more effort. They don't live in New York. They have to try and find a teacher. They have to go some distance. And oh. it's not easy. And there are also, sometimes if the teacher has a big uh, following, then the following, the students might form an obstacle to you getting close to the teacher. They're like, you know, oh, you can only see him if, you know, you're important or you're a donor or you're, you know, like, they can form an obstacle. So there's a lot of these different challenges to being able to meet a teacher, aside from the fact that it, it should be a teacher who has lineage or who has something to offer. Because you don't always know that going in. You might be famous and not be anything um, yeah. except famous. So access is a really important thing. Having access, finding access is really challenging. And, and there are stories of people who travel all the way to India to meet a teacher you know, and sometimes come back without having met a teacher, but like thousands of miles to get to a place where they can meet a teacher. That's a lot of effort. And that's not something everybody can do. Well, now that we're in this situation, where so much, you know, we're in a lockdown. Yeah. And everybody is learning how to communicate via Zoom or, um, you know, via other methods, live video, whatever kind of conferencing people use, uh, learning how to connect with other people digitally. And it's kind of incredible that all of this uh, digital development and, and bandwidth uh, came into place in time for this. I mean, we're talking about lucky, 
we're all really lucky. If you can imagine this without being able to video conference with people, wow. Um, right, it's but, almost but like the, perfect timing. <laughs> yeah, really good, good thing. Thank you, Skype, thank you, Zoom, thank you, Facebook. All of you did a good job getting us ready. Um, monopolies, but did a good job. Uh, but what has happened and what I've noticed is that I've actually been able to spend time with some of my teachers that I haven't seen in years because they live in India and I'm not getting to India anytime soon. Or they, they spend time up in a cabin in you know, Northern California and they don't like to come out because they like to be calm and peaceful and they teach people there if you get there, you know, but like I haven't been able to get there. One of the teachers who guided me through all these retreats up at the Buddhist center, like I had, I hadn't seen him in over a decade. And then I just got to see him recently because of teleconferencing. And some of these Tibetan teachers in India who actually will give teachings and, and some who've given empowerments, which is really un, was unheard of before, to give a transmission uh, over the airwaves, you know, through, um, through Wi-Fi. You know, really part of the whole tradition is that you have to be in the presence of one of these teachers. Well, guess what? That can work online. You can be in the presence of a teacher and get something from them. Might not be the same as them putting their hand on your head or, you know, something like that, but you can get a transmission through a video conference. And that's something that most people might not imagine is true. So there have been some of the, one of the highest lamas in the Tibetan tradition, you know, there are four schools of Tibetan Buddhism. One of the heads of one of the four schools, he gave an empowerment the Dalai Lama gave an initiation, maybe not a formal empowerment, but he gave one of these, you know, um, kind of es essential initiations online. And people got a little ruffled about it. It's like, you can't give an empowerment online. And, you know, he's like, I'm the Dalai Lama. <laughs> I can't. You know, and, you know. <laughs> tell me to stop. Yeah. Which is beautiful. So, yeah. I mean, we're becoming more interconnected with, and the access to knowledge and information. And I mean, you were even saying before that I caught that, you know, Tibetan Buddhism didn't even come over to the United States until the 1970s. So, you know, the access of this information has exponentially increased for people to dive in. And maybe it's not the Tibetan Buddhism uh, path for those that are watching, but uh, it's whatever path that is for you. This is happening across all of it. So even if we're, me and David are talking about Tibetan Buddhism, you might be more drawn into whatever um, path and teachings, but it's across all of the ways, a lot of these ancient wisdoms and knowledge haven't been, as they've been in secrecy or they've been very uh, closed off where not a lot of access has been uh, available to people, right. especially in the West. And so what, what a beautiful, beautiful thing to be able to do. And I think when people start to be able to wrap their head around or have a, a, an experience, they can start to get that energy it doesn't have um, – distance restrictions and that the experience can still be received no matter where geographically somebody is. And, and I not think just geographically, like you were asking me about uh, if, if Chagya Rinpoche was still my teacher and I mm -hmm. said, yes, and he died yeah. and he was reincarnated, but I still think he's my teacher. Like I, that didn't end. Yeah. I still get energy from him. And in fact, when he died, when he left his body in 2002, some incredible stuff happened in my practice. And in the Buddhist tradition, they say that when the teacher leaves the limitations of their body, then their blessings can flow out to all their students without any limitation. So there's almost like, you know, when somebody in the ordinary world dies and they have an inheritance that they distribute amongst their children or their friends, people get stuff, they inherit things from them. Well, when a teacher who has wisdom and, and blessing power uh, dies. There's like an inheritance that we each get. There's a, 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 not a quantity, but a kind of blessing that we each get that is part of the relationship that we held with that teacher when they were alive. So yeah. I, I had extraordinary experiences. I didn't know that he had died until a few days later. But like I was thinking of him and I was, you know, he's coming up in my meditation and I was like, wow, I'm really feeling Rinpoche these days. And then I found out two days later he had passed away. So these connections are, they don't, uh, there's not a distance. That 
that can stop them or death that can stop them. Like you said, not matter. Absolutely. Of when you're talking about true life and death doesn't matter. Time and space doesn't matter, you know? Mm-hmm. And they just, they're constructs of our, our physical reality that yeah. we're operating in. in Oh, David, you're breaking up a little bit. Can you hear me? One of the pitfalls of the technology. Oh, uh, there we go. And then, David, you're breaking up a little bit. I said one of the pitfalls, pitfalls of some of the technology, even though it's giving us greatness, we're constantly there improving. Satellites are improving everything along those lines. Right. <laughs> yeah. And David, I think this is probably a good t- spot to wrap everything up. Um, I want people to be able to find you and you teach um, the first Wednesday of every month uh, at Liberate hosting uh, meditation, but you also are uh, teach and do other things elsewhere. So where can people find you? Well, um, for right now, I don't have like a, a, an online presence for the teaching, but if people can want to email me, Okay. Then I can send out, uh, put them on the list, and they can get notices about when I give other classes. Usually it's through Zoom. Um, so my email is david at compassionunlimited.net. So compassionunlimited.net, not .com, not .org. David at compassionunlimited, all one phrase, one word, david at compassionunlimited.net. And we'll put it down there, too, for everybody. Great. Great. And thank you. thank you, David. This was a beautiful conversation. And I think it's going to be extremely impactful for a lot of people uh, that are ready and seeking this information and knowledge for their evolution and um, in moving forward in their path. Um, yeah, I and really thank you. I really, I really appreciate you having me on. It's always a pleasure for me to teach meditation, but boy, I'll tell you, it's even more of a pleasure for me to talk about my teachers and uh, because that just brings it all up. And oh, one last thing. Yes. If you're looking for a teacher, there's something important to recognize and remember, which is that there are three things that if people say them, it automatically means they're not. Mm. So if someone says, I'm cool, they're not. If someone says, I'm humble, they're not. If someone says, I'm enlightened. They're not. So watch out. If the teacher says they're enlightened, I became enlightened in this year. Not good. Be careful. Be careful. Signal of massive ego. <laughs> yes. Not it massive heart. <laughs> That's right. Oh, thank you. Beautiful thank you. wisdom. Uh, <laughs> until next time, David, have a beautiful yes. day. You too. Good to see you. If you enjoyed this conversation, like it, subscribe, and share it with your friends. If you want some more amazing resources on your path of liberation, head over to liberateyourself.com and sign up for our mailing list. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram at Liberate Hollywood. All one word or Liberate Emporium. All one word. Until next time, liberate yourself. Hey, well, um, my name is Rebecca. Hi, I'm Reverend Doreen. Hi, my name is Travis. My name is Kimberly. My name is Lily, and I'm an energy healer at Liberate Hollywood. I really believe that everything is transmutable and everything is possible. I believe that we are swimming in a sea of energy and um, that this energy is love, even though I know a lot of the time it doesn't always feel like that. And I do pranic healing, which is energy. I'm a Reiki master, more energy. So what am I? I am a channel for energy to come through me to help you. There really isn't anything that you would need to do to prepare for a session other than be comfortable. The whole goal of the session is to provide you with a warm, comforting, soul and heart-centered environment from which to allow healing to occur. No, no, just come as you are. Always just come as you are. Uh, That's my job as a healer, to meet you where you are, to figure out what you need. and to give that to you or to guide you also. Um, I'm so honored to be a guide in helping you to connect. To help re-energize you, 
heal you, change your programming so that you're no longer in your way of getting to the things that you desire in your life. My objective working with clients, I guess, would be to help them connect to their divine self uh, so that they can facilitate their spiritual journey and their soul's path. In all forms of energy healing, regardless of what the practitioner says, it is up to the client to change their life. As a practitioner, we're serving as a channel or as, a, as an instrument for God to do the work, but it is up to the client to, to make better choices. I'm most passionate, I think, about being able to create a loving, supportive, and heart and soul-centered environment for clients to heal. I get really excited when I ha ex have a new client who's never experienced energy work before, and they tend to say that they were drawn or magnetized into the store, and they don't exactly know why or what for. And it's, a, it's an opportunity to introduce them to the divine. And I think it's a really beautiful thing to have that moment of awareness and that they're in that space of surrender because they don't have any expectations. And they really get to see what it feels like to be a spiritual being. Once you activate that place within yourself, uh, it's powerful and it feels so good. It's very healthy for the body. I think it realigns all of your energy. Um, it connects you to source, uh, both within you and outside of you. It's really cool. It's such an honor and a privilege to be in the space where a moment happens and people have this awareness about who they are or they're able to grieve over something they may not have been able to before or they are able to see themselves for who they truly are in a more empowered and soul-centered way. But I'm trying to give you the tools so that when you leave, you feel, you feel connected. Come with an open mind, come with um, humor in your heart, and, and we'll get you on the right path for you. You'll learn more about yourself, you'll let go of things that might be holding you back in your life, and you'll feel more empowered about your decisions. I hope to see you soon. So, expect change. Radical change. <laughs> I laugh, but it's true. <laughs> Thank you, and I wish you love, peace, and higher consciousness.